Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Talent Finders would like to welcome Brooke B, known as Babylon Brooke, who is an international award-winning host, TV and stage actor, and Fortune 500 spokesperson. So welcome, Brooke. Hello, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Brooke, I'd like to congratulate you on all your achievements. Can you share with us more about how your entrepreneurial and entertainment journey started? Sure. So I started what feels like many moons ago, before social media, yes. <laughs> before any, any of this technology. And my career began as an actor in musical theater. So that was my primarily my start and where I spent most of my time. I toured with musicals nationally, that kind of thing. And then over time, I went over into TV land and began doing a lot of commercials, work like that. And then it just segued into hosting and spokesperson work. That's amazing. Wow. So you've had a diverse career in a cross section of industries from TV host and stage actor, diversifying into speaking and a spokesperson for Fortune 500 companies. So can you share with the audience more about this? And was this an organic process for you or was it a challenge? It was both. I think anything in the entertainment world is quite the challenge, right? (laughs) It certainly isn't a defined path like most other industries and careers are. At the same time though, it it did happen pretty organically. So I worked very hard, but when I started to segue into spokesperson work, it just happened. My agent and manager at the time said, we'd like to cast you in these roles and they were spokesperson roles. And then that led to more spokesperson work. And I just, went down that path and I realized pretty quickly that as much as I loved acting, I really felt a great affinity for hosting. That it just fit. I've always loved learning more about other people. I've always, I, I do have a news background as well. So I've always loved interviewing people, learning more about them, learning more about what they do, you know, who they are, where they come from. And so hosting was, a very natural fit. So from that standpoint, that did happen organically. Wow. So the entertainment industry is a highly competitive industry. Hmm. So what do you believe makes you different and keeps you relevant? And can you give us any examples? I think having different interests is so key I would suggest that for anyone. So again, I came from musical theater. So I had the acting, the singing, the dancing background, and then went into the hosting world and had the news journalism background as well. That's what my degree was in. It's what I worked in even simultaneously while acting, I was doing a little bit of both. So I think having my foot in both sides really helped and was a strength because many people would show up to audition for a role and they're actors, they're great at acting, but maybe they don't have strong teleprompter skills. Yes. And then other people on the other side of the coin, maybe they would show up for some sort of hosting part and they could have a great personality from being an, or I guess it's the other way around. It's been a long day already, but you know what I mean? Like a host, maybe a host doesn't have the acting background to bring that personality to the table and they're more clean cut and just asking questions, just interviewing, but they don't have, you know, that real interaction and that more of the well-roundedness that an actor has to bring to the table. So I think, absolutely, yeah. And also I think as well, like, because you have mastered many arenas or many areas, I think that also puts you at an advantage because I think the days of just being an actor or just being a musician have obviously long gone. I agree. I definitely agree. And I think that that's the beauty of now. I wish it had been like this decades ago. Yeah. I'm glad I'm glad it is now though. And I think that for anyone in the entertainment industry, it's important to be as well-rounded as possible and to bring all of your personality and all of your skills and background to the table. Yeah, absolutely. 
So what would you say some of your biggest career or your biggest lessons and learnings have been within your career? Biggest lessons? I'm sure there's a multitude, but I mean, what kind of stands out for you the most? The one that comes to mind more than anything else is learning to be myself. Yeah. I think I think that's a tough one to learn. And, yeah. and I think for people in entertainment. Yeah, because you're wearing so many different hats and playing so many different characters, right? Exactly. And I think a lot of us get into entertainment as an escape. Yes. From being ourselves and our own. So you life. almost have to escape the opposite to become yourself. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it took yeah. me a long time to really figure out who is Brooke? Who am I? What are my interests outside of acting? You know, because I was just so many different roles for so long. So I think learning more about yourself, it goes back to the last question, what we were just talking about. The more you figure out about yourself, the better. And the more you can bring that uniqueness to the Mm. table, it's only going to work in your favor. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to touch on social media, Mm. as this is one of your focuses in speaking as well as mindset. So social media has been a positive and negative tool of which we all use. So Mm. what do you believe we as humanity need to do to improve the current narrative to use these tools more responsibly, especially with the oversaturation of information? That's a really good question. I think it is so easy to go down the rabbit hole, isn't it? Oh, big time. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And especially when you look at this past year with U.S. politics. Oh my word. That that says it all. (laughs) Right? It's so easy to go down that rabbit hole. And so I think setting boundaries for ourselves Mm. is extremely important otherwise we do we all fall victim to it we all go down that rabbit hole and before we know it we're exhausted Mm. we're feeling all these emotions we don't want to feel and we wonder why (laughs) and it's very obvious right and and also I think the thing is that in saying that as well it's like you know you get the harassment side you get the defamation Mm. of character side you get all of that and I think that you know, it's interesting because, and I'm just saying this from my perspective and and maybe you want to highlight the point, but, you know, I guess like what you were saying about boundaries is that people don't tend to have a filter. So it's like when people are messaging or texting or, you know, involved in these sexual harassment kind of scenarios is that there doesn't seem to be a filter. There doesn't seem to be a boundary. And yet, if that person had to stand in front of you and say the same thing, they would not be doing that. So I don't know. That's, I, I just kind of wanted your opinion on that. Exactly. I completely agree. And I have been, <laughs> I've had my share of cyber bullying to the point of actually having to move. Wow. It went from bullying into stalking. And that's an extreme, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree with you where most people would never do most of the things that they do online if they were in front of someone. Mm. And there's almost this acceptance of that kind of behavior because Mm. they're hiding behind a screen. Mm. So to go back to your original question, I think we need to set boundaries for ourselves. And I also think we need to set an example that we're not going to stand for that kind of behavior. So for me personally, I I didn't know when I first got really big into social media land, it took me a couple of years, but now I, as soon as my gut gives me some sort of indication that something's off with a person, I will then distance myself. Whereas before I would continue engaging and interacting. Now I know, okay, it's like I have radar. And once that goes off, you know, no, I'm not going to continue to engage and allow that kind of behavior, whether they're treating me a certain way or if I see them treating someone else a certain way. So I think as a collective, we really need to be aware, more aware of that behavior and set an example, you know, not tolerate it and make that very clear. Absolutely. So 
You are an award-winning international host. Can you share with us more about this? And having won these awards, did this open other doors for you within your career? Yes. I mean, I've worked very hard. I actually even had my own company for some time that produced a show. So I, yeah, I I definitely worked my tail off to, again, be unique and stand out and bring other strengths to the table. And it opened doors, but unfortunately, when things started to go up was when I then had health stuff happen (laughs) where that went down. So I, yeah, I was really ready for everything to catapult in a big way for me career wise, but then my health took a turn. So I'm sure it would have opened up many more doors had I not had that. But now I'm very grateful for everything that I've been able to do in my career and yeah, very thankful and looking forward to what lies ahead. Yes, absolutely. So what would you say some of your biggest career highlights have been? Like what stands out for you the most? There was one commercial in particular that I signed on to do. And little did I know that it was then going to turn into a series of commercials. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And I wound up being a mom. Like I played the mom for a particular brand for some time and I thought it was just going to be a regional thing and wound up being national than international. And so where I'm from, I live in Los Angeles, but I'm from the East Coast and many people back there got to see these commercials. And then I remember one day a friend of mine wound up on a flight. He was on a U.S. Airways flight and texted me a screenshot of the back of the chair in front of him and my face was on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, I mean, it was just crazy. So I didn't get paid for any of that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, US Air. But still, it, it was just this amazing thing that took off. And that was a really neat experience that, oh, my gosh, little do you know, sometimes you can do some work and it can wind up in a bunch of different places. And so it was a neat feeling. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. So you went through a life-altering accident which kept you housebound for many years. Can you share with us more about this and how it impacted and influenced you to the person you are today? Yeah, um, so I was in a car accident out here in Los Angeles. It was a four-car pileup. <gasps> My car was in the middle and I was in an SUV, so a very robust vehicle and it was smashed and totaled. Oh I'm very God. lucky to be here. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things, the really strange part about it was that for the first year after I had tremendous pain and I was seeking treatment for that. But then throughout that year, I began to have difficulty breathing and speaking and they couldn't pinpoint why. So that then led to a bunch of spinal surgeries and hospitalizations and all these things to try to help the situation, but nothing, they were band-aids, really, nothing was helping to fix it. And so I wound up down that path for several years. It was a wild goose chase, just trying to figure out. And it was very scary and I was only getting worse. And I was told by a couple doctors that I wouldn't be here for much longer to say my goodbyes, all this stuff. I mean, it was just- crazy. Then I had other doctors that were saying, well, we don't know what's wrong. Maybe it's in your head. I mean, it was just, I was, I was being told everything. Yeah. So So, many varying opinions. So many. And so I wound up becoming housebound because I could no longer be transported to go see specialists for what was going on in my body, it turns out that a nerve in the body, the most important nerve in the body was impacted. So it took them years to figure this out. And this nerve, it's like, if you look at your computer, you look at your body like a computer, it's Mm. the motherboard of your computer. And that nerve runs to every major system in the body, cardiovascular, pulmonary, respiratory, everything. So I would stand up, my heart rate would go to 160, I would fall down and I'd have to crawl to the phone to call 911. Like that was my life for some time. And it was just 
horrific. So as that continued to increase, I could no longer be in a car because the vibration would upset the nerve. Oh, no. And by the time I would get to the doctor or specialist, I would, I couldn't breathe. I'd have to go to the hospital. And it was just this over and over again. So I had to become housebound and then I had home health care six days a week. A doctor would come for anywhere between four to six hours a day. Um, and the rest of the time, my partner became my 24 seven caregiver, um, would spoon feed me, take me to the bathroom, all of that. And I would just lay on a massage table, flat on my back, staring at the ceiling, wondering why I was here. So in addition to trying to hang on physically, mentally and emotionally, it took a toll because yeah. uh, financially I went bankrupt. I was suicidally depressed all of that stuff, every, like your worst nightmare in every way. I, yeah. I didn't want to be here. I didn't think there was a reason for me to be here. So I did hang on and that's where Babylon comes from. Babylon means keep going. Cause I had to come up with some kind of mantra to keep me going. Mm, I love it. I think it's great. <laughs> so that, that's why I go by Babylon Brook because that's a huge piece that I speak about and that I share with people to encourage them to keep going, to let them know that anything is possible and also to let them know that they're not alone. I couldn't find anything online that resembled my experience. And so I felt extremely alone, but there was something deep down that was telling me to keep going. And I'm glad I did because what wound up happening was I took to live streaming. In 2015, I got on Periscope which is Twitter's live streaming arm. And I began sharing my experience. And this was even before I could speak. Some of the Periscope wow. the live streams, I would just blink. We taught them my language of blinking. And which was really them asking a question and one blink meant yes, two meant no, three meant I love you. Wow. So, yeah, I did that for some time and showed them what the doctor visits were like, which were not your average doctor visit showed them what that life was like. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really glad I did because so many people from around the world began writing and messaging saying that seeing that changed their lives for mm -hmm. some of them, seeing it saved their lives. And for me, I mean, it was so worth it. Mm -hmm. to, would I want to go through that again? No, because I feel like I, in a way I lost a decade. It's, it's yeah. almost a 10 year journey yeah. and, and really my thirties for the most part. Mm. But where it's put me today is I have so much to share mm. before. Yes. I was acting. I was a spokesperson. That's all well and good. But now my purpose is so much greater. I have this message to share and to inspire and motivate people. And to me, nothing is better than that. Like, helping people change and save their lives that's incredible so I'm very thankful in that way mm. for the experience wow that's an amazing story oh, thank you wow <laughs> um, I know it's crazy I know it's even still to this day and I've told it so many times but still when it comes out of my mouth and I've only told you the tip of the iceberg it, it still is like oh my gosh am I talking about me I feel like mm. I'm describing a movie you know yeah like, yeah so well there should be a movie on you because that's uh, <laughs> quite a mind-blowing uh, story and uh, like you say it inspired a lot of people so certainly inspiring me for sure so can you share with us more about the speaking did this come about after your accident and was this a process for you entering the speaking arena the Speaking on the motivational side of things has really come as a result of sharing my story. Yeah. So, so much of it has been online because it had to be for my health and recovery. I just started getting out to doctors and out and about in the last few years. So that's yeah. still a new, a new thing for me. Okay. Uh, and the speaking really came from that. I just started sharing and people wanted to hear more. And again, having the speaking and hosting background or spokesperson and 
hosting background, it, it was just such a perfect fit because I didn't need the training of how to speak or how to engage an audience. Yeah. It was just now I was marrying those skills with a really powerful message. Yes. Yeah, well, that makes sense. So, yeah. so you're also a proud advocate for invisible disabilities and conditions. So can you share with us more about this and has it helped you in your healing journey? Yes, I'm such a proud advocate. There are millions of people around the world who have some sort of disability or condition that is unseen to the naked eye. So, for example, with me, even as I began to recover, you couldn't tell that anything was going on inside my body because I wasn't in a wheelchair or, you know, I didn't use any sort of device. I was in a a hard plastic neck brace for several years, but even that people would kind of go, eh, it's not a wheelchair. (laughs) And there are so many people who don't use any sort of device, but they are dealing with a really challenging situation. So Mm. I think about like MS, multiple sclerosis or fibromyalgia or CRPS or RSD. There are so many and these people are really having a difficult time, but you would never know it when you look at them. And many people don't understand it, to be honest. I mean, I know people who have fibromyalgia that, I mean, I know what it is, and I've also seen a lot of the actual struggles that these people were I'm close with one particular friend of mine, and I've seen, you know, the struggle that they have, but, you know, so it, it makes sense that a lot of people, like you say, don't necessarily see the actual condition or the actual struggle. Exactly, and it's easy when you see someone in a wheelchair to automatically make assumptions and go, oh, okay, that person has difficulty doing A, B, or C, you know, and and so therefore I'm going to be more aware, I'm going to, you know, do whatever I need to do, offer help, but that doesn't happen with people that have conditions that are invisible. So I, I do advocate for that, and I'm involved with a few organizations that raise awareness, and my whole thing is just for everyone in this whole world to keep an open mind and to understand that most people are dealing with something underneath the surface, whether it's a physical challenge or not, it can be mental, it can be emotional and, and just to be more kind, really. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. And more compassionate. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. I don't know, like just a question that I wanted to ask you because when you were in that, you know, situation where you couldn't walk or you had like the physical side of it, did people treat you differently? Because, you know, sometimes I've noticed, I'm not saying this in your case, but I have noticed this, like, you know, when someone's sitting in a wheelchair, then a person talking to them thinks they're deaf and then they start speaking louder. <laughs> you yeah. know, like you, you have like these sort of scenarios and I'm like, the person is maybe not able to walk, but they still can hear. (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. You know, I, yes, I did. I had some of that, but I mostly had the other side of the coin where people just, they couldn't understand why I couldn't open doors, you know? And even when I had like lived for years in this, you know, you can imagine one of those hard plastic neck braces, they're very limiting. But I I wouldn't, to this day, I need help with doors. Mm. But when I was in that, people couldn't under, well, why do you have difficulty doing anything? Isn't it your neck? It's like, yes, but your neck stems out to your arms (laughs) and the rest of your body, like it's your neck. Yeah. People people just could not, it was like, could not get it, you know? It's like one organ cannot function without the other organ, you know, they're not independent of each (laughs) other. Yeah. I know it's not funny, but I just, you know, I find it kind of weird that people have that mind state. It's just bizarre. Yep. But again, it's because, number one, they haven't been exposed to it before. Yeah. I hadn't been exposed to it before. Yeah. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine. For me, it's, I think people need to be willing to learn mm. and understand and that's where I came up against a lot of roadblocks was that I have people in my life, including my own family, who were completely unwilling to learn. Mm. 
Mm. So that led to, sorry, I'm turning, my phones are coming off. So that led to a lot of, uh, well, it led to estrangement because Mm. they just couldn't get on board. And so they wouldn't support because they couldn't wrap their head around it. So I understand if there are people in this world that don't understand something at first Mm. because they haven't been exposed to it. But Mm. I think we need to, all of us, whether we're talking about a condition or disability or talking about being more understanding of like race relations or sexual orientation or anything. It's a matter of us just all learning so that we can understand each other. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. also having a level of tolerance because I think like you said, people don't understand they can get impatient um, right. and they can lack empathy. So I totally understand. You've recently become in high demand on the platform Clubhouse as a moderator. Mm -hmm. So can you please share with us more about those who don't know what Clubhouse is and what your role as a moderator is and the benefits of being on such a platform? Yes, I love Clubhouse. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. It is an audio only app where you can use it for a multitude of purposes. You can use it for your business. So you can go on and you can talk about your business or you can teach people about what you know so you can share your knowledge. You can go on to learn, which many people do. So you can learn from all kinds of experts who are on there sharing. Or you can go on to grow your network and make connections and foster relationships and collaborations. And I'm on for all three of those reasons. The, the possibilities are limitless with Clubhouse. And I think what, what I found, having been in the live streaming world where it was all video, okay. and now we have this app that's all audio, I'm finding that more people are open to being on this app because not a lot of people are comfortable on video. No, I'm one of those people. I must be honest. It's a struggle. (laughs) Yeah. And that's completely understandable. Mm -hmm. So I think more people are willing to be on this app because they go, oh my gosh, I I can go on and no one has to see me and and I can still share. Yes. You know, and I think from that perspective, it's very empowering. I think it's helping amplify a lot of people's voices. So I love it. I got involved with it. Oh my gosh. It's been very recent for me. It's only Yeah, me too. I think I've probably been on like maybe five weeks or so. You know, I want to say I'm I'm probably about the same. I Mm. joined the last week of December, but I didn't use it until mid January. Mm. And now we're early February, but I've been living on that app. Mm. And so moderators on there are people who run rooms. Clubhouse is com- comprised of many different rooms and you yes. can go on at any time. You can start your own room. You can join other people's rooms and moderators run the room. So they're kind of like hosts in that way. Yes. And For me, just a perfect fit. I get to use my skills and my background and go on there. And whether I'm hosting my own room or I'm doing it on behalf of someone else, it's a great symbiosis. So I love it. And I'm on it way too much. (laughs) Like way, way, way too much. (laughs) The one question I do want to ask about Clubhouse, because, you know, I know it's very easy to get addicted and to be Mm -hmm. on there for hours and hours and hours. But the one thing, you know, and we all know it's like any uh, social media platform or any tool that we have is that there are also a lot of people on there that's promoting, you know, saying they one thing, but then, you know, you go to the Instagram and I'm not saying Instagram is necessarily um, an indication of that person, but mm-hmm. sometimes there's just a disconnect and, you know, I'm just wondering like how do you sift through a lot of the garbage because there's a lot of people that claim to be a lot of things you know they run six seven eight figure and you know I'm also tired of hearing about that because I feel yeah. like you know I feel like there's a balance to everything 
and you know, I'm just putting the question to you because I have been in some rooms, obviously some are, are bigger than others in terms of these things. But like one of the things that I did want to, well, there's actually two things I wanted to ask you on this. The one is, yes, I understand people who have rooms specifically pertaining to a specific subject. But mm -hmm. when I first went on, I started feeling like I get people need to be authentic and, and be truthful about their stories and, and all of that. But in some instances, I felt like, am I in like an AA meeting or <laughs> like somebody, you know, talking about, you know, and I, and I don't take suicide thing because you and I've spoken about it or you spoke briefly on it, um, you know, in, in terms of your environment. But I, I think there's a very fine line when it comes to things like that, because you don't want to be like feeling like, oh, everybody's like, or one particular or several particular people are dumping all of their emotional things on there. And then it's like, it's hard enough because people are trying to navigate through COVID and, you know, a lot of people have their own issues. So mm -hmm. there's that, there's that side. And then the other side, and I don't know whether you were on the one with Elon Musk um, and they were the moderators. Mm -hmm. So the issue that I had with that or the things that I picked up on that was none of the moderators, that, well, firstly, no one could ask a question, which I get like there were thousands, 5,000 or more people on, on the thing, so it's difficult. But the other issue that I had, and I've kind of noticed it with the person that uh, you know, instigated the Elon Musk, you know, interview, which is great. And it's great that they got him on there and whatever. But A, I felt that the questions were not, there was nothing original about the questions. It's all the same stuff we've heard before. The mm -hmm. second thing I felt was that the, the majority of moderators on the panel were men. There were very few women. I think there was maybe two women, if, I'm, if I stand to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is that I kind of feel like now they're getting high on their own supply because now, you know, they've had Zuckerberg and whatever. And I don't like, I think it's great, but I think it's almost becoming like the billionaire's boys club. And that there's like, why are they not bringing in more women into these things? And it's almost like people are bringing in their friends to be moderators so that they could be seen on the panel because they were interviewing this person. And I'm, I'm not saying it is like that, but, my perception that it comes across like that because I haven't seen very few women as moderators on that high level of panel. And secondly, where are the women, these billionaire or millionaire women being interviewed like the Elon Musk's? And that's kind of the question mm -hmm. I have for you. And you know Clubhouse better than I do, but that's just my take on it. So could mm -hmm. be wrong. I definitely think there are a lot of women, a lot of successful women on the app. I think it depends on which rooms you're in. Mm -hmm. With regards to the Elon Musk interview, I think you're right. I think there were two. And I, you know, I don't know much about uh, like his interview or Mark's interview, but like, I don't know the people behind the scenes. I, I'm, I'm not really connected to them specifically I yeah. was moderating in a room where one of the people that was interviewing came in and he was talking with us but I don't know too much about that to really speak on that but I'm very impressed with the women on the app yeah. and I agree with you I think it would be nice for one of the upcoming people that is highlighted in such a way to be a woman yeah. I I also think, though, that it, it's really just a matter of who wants to come on the app. You know, yeah. like for whatever reason, Elon was interested. And then right after, Mark was interested. And now people yeah. are saying, you know, who's next? And maybe it's Jeff Bezos. I know his name is being thrown around a lot. So I think it's also a matter of who is at that crazy high level in the world. You know, they are some of the biggest names and for whatever reason now they're they're interested in clubhouse which i think has a lot to say about clubhouse and its potential and its future absolutely I think, yeah i think we will start to see more of the heavy hitters like the females yeah come on you know like the sarah blakely's and, and yeah like sarah blakely people you know yeah. I, I just because i think that that's the you know i, I kind of want to touch on the, the point around you know women and i don't want it to become like a male female thing just in the discussion but 
I am interested, you know, like in order for us to change the narrative of the inequality or the imbalance of these things is that, you know, there needs to be more inclusivity in terms of these things. So, you know, I'm just saying like perceptions that are created may not necessarily be correct, but it's a narrative that is continued. And I feel as a woman that there needs to be more women highlighted. And I'm not saying that they're not moderating or they're not in other rooms, but in terms of that, that high level that yeah. is in there, there needs to be a shift because, I mean, I did tweet the guy and I said, look, I think you did a fantastic job. But I said, you know, like, it, it kind of feels like the Bullionaires Boy Club. And, you know, are you guys going to help to navigate and change the narrative towards, you know, interviewing the likes of Sarah Blakey or whoever, you know? So never got a response because, you know, I don't expect to. But I was just, I'm just interested in your perspective on it. I think that that'll happen organically over time. Do you know who Barbara Corcoran is? Yes, I do. She's a shark tank, right? Yes. Yes. She joined just recently. Oh, good. And I think she's fantastic. And so that was really I love her. She's fabulous. She's totally off the wall, but I love her. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She's, She's amazing. One of a kind. And so they did have a room for her. I think it, depends on the level of people's interest Mm. also in Mm. a particular person and I think you know yeah it'd be great to see Sarah Blakely on there it's also though how many people in the world know Sarah Blakely compared to how many people know who Elon Musk is or Mark Zuckerberg so I think it really comes down to that but I do I I believe it's all going to happen organically and we're going to see more people and um yeah it's exciting I mean who would have thought that it would happen this quickly? I, I certainly didn't think that no. <laughs> those kinds of names. I mean, I just saw the tweet on Elon's thing and it was like, okay, he's going to be on Clubhouse. I mean, I managed to listen in on one of the other moderator's rooms because obviously, you know, there right. was a cap on the, the number of people on that particular mm-hmm. room. But uh, yeah, it was, it was just interesting. But I did kind of feel like there were quite a few opportunities lost to, to ask different questions because. There's nothing that Elon said in that interview. And I respect Elon because I'm, you know, ex South African myself. So I have a huge amount of respect for him. But I felt like the questions themselves that were answered could have been better because it's stuff that I've heard in mul- and I've listened to many interviews of his. And it was like there was nothing original about the question. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just uh, that's just my take on it. It's not like a negative, it's just to say, like, you know, sometimes people need to kind of do more of their research. And because I think he also likes it when he gets asked questions that make him think. And that are different. Just, yeah, rather than just the same old, oh, okay, like, well, what do you do in the mornings when you wake up? It's like, well, he is a human being. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he probably does reach for his phone. <laughs> you right. know, those right. are things. I get it. But like, is it really that important? You know what I mean? Like in what the greatest you ask him? What would be what would be one of your questions that you would want to ask him? I mean, for me, I think because one of my objectives actually is to interview him, but I am gonna obviously do it in a different way. But I think for me, you know, I think it would be like more around because I'm kind of more interested in the technical aspects of what he does and how he foresees, you know, maybe he has a vision beyond Mars or whatever, but I'd be interested around this basics. I mean, Tesla, obviously I'm I'm extremely interested in, but I think that for me, I'd also be interested to kind of ask him about what also, what bigger visions, because maybe he has bigger visions or what, what is a bigger vision beyond what he's doing or does he have a bigger agenda or a bigger vision over and above what he's doing in, you know, in his various companies. Mm-hmm. So, like you know, I would have to think carefully. I mean, that's one of the things that I would definitely do before, you know, just launching into a bunch of questions. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, I'm just really intrigued by his level of intellect because Mm -hmm. I think that he is so beyond most people's level of comprehension or vision, Mm -hmm. you know? So like when people said, Oh, like you spoke about doing electric cars and, you know, he was poo-pooed and, you know, people kind of didn't believe in the concept or didn't want to invest. And 
and I've read his book. I read the book by Ashley Vance. And I'm telling you, like that guy, he has endured more pressure mm -hmm. and at such a highly intense level that mm -hmm. the majority of people would not be able to cope with that and probably would have had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. it's, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily good for everybody, but that's the funny thing is because it's like people are like Elon this and Elon that. I'm like, I get it. But the point is, is that Elon is built in such a way, both on a mental, emotional, spiritual, intellectual level, that he is obviously capable of handling that. I'm not saying he's invincible, but for the majority of people, that is not in the realm of their comprehension. Mm -hmm. because they can barely keep it together for one business or two businesses. This guy mm -hmm. has like six companies, you know, even if he's just a shareholder in some of these things. But I mean, when you like three days away from almost being bankrupt, and then the U.S. government actually giving you X billion to continue SpaceX. The adrenaline and the intensity of the pressure that he endured, mm -hmm. as I said, most people just would never be able to comprehend it. I agree with you. I think, and I've always thought that he's amazing. I never understood why people wanted to bring him down. I, I, it just makes no sense. I see a guy who's, like you said, highly intellectual, has yeah. a brain that is unlike anyone else in our generation at least, and wants to better the world. He wants to use his intellect to advance us. Yeah. Advance humanity and help humanity. That's okay. what I see. Yeah. And why, why would you want to bring that guy down? I've never understood it. No. Um, my question for him, because I was in a room prior to his interview, I was part of moderating that room. And one of the people who was going to be asking questions came into the room and asked us what we would like to ask. So my question, it wasn't used, but my question was, what does he dream about? And do his dreams have any impact on what he then does, what mm. he creates? Like, yeah. how does he get these ideas? Do they come from when he's awake and, and he's actively thinking? Or do they come to him in other ways, like through his subconscious? That, yeah. That's like, like, I would love to know where, do, where does this, who thinks let's go to Mars? Like yeah. who thinks let's actually do it? And who thinks of, you know, yeah, the cars and, and all of that. So that would be my question. If you ever get to interview him, please ask. <laughs> no, I will. I mean, I'll have a discussion after the interview with you. But I mean, one of the things that I feel and why I kind of feel like I relate to Elon is because he grew up in South Africa. He had a hard time at school. He went to Pretoria Boys High. He read a lot. So I feel like going back to your question, and I'm not going to answer on behalf of him because that would be arrogant and, and incorrect, but in terms of him and the way that he grew up and, you know, like he grew up during apartheid, obviously, you know, and then he left because he didn't want to go to the army. And so, you know, he, he basically flew to Canada, landed in Canada and called up his mom and said, well, what do I do now? And this is why I say it's very interesting as a South African, because a lot of people kind of underestimate, you know, we've had some great exports that have come into the U.S., the Charlize Theron, uh, mm -hmm. the Mark Shuttleworth, you know, the Elon Musks and various other people, uh, Trevor Noah and so on, you know, different levels, but still. So for me, I think the reason I'm proud is because I think the fact that he came from South Africa, you know, he's obviously very American now, but he came from South Africa and the level of resilience mm -hmm. and, you know, the adversity that we grew up in within our own country even irrespective of black, white, whatever. And I mean, you know, I'm not speaking from a disadvantaged perspective, but there's definitely adversity and real political challenges. Not that the rest of the world doesn't have that, but specifically, you know, and then him going to Canada and then quitting college or varsity and going to the States and building what he's built. And I've stood outside SpaceX. And when you stand there, and you look at it and you go, oh my God, like the magnitude of what this guy has built is just beyond most people's comprehension. It's just mind blowing. You know, that's why I'm so proud, even though he's not 
live in South Africa anymore, but the fact that he actually came from that and of course. built something, it's just blows my mind. So don't underestimate South Africans. <laughs> no, no, there's no question. I, I yeah. mean, I think anyone that overcomes anything in life is someone that we can learn from. And I personally have such empathy and also admiration for people that do that. And so, yeah, I think anyone that has come out of South Africa, especially during that time, it's incredible. It's yeah. Incredible. So that leads me to the last two questions. So what are the three key pieces of advice that you would give to other entrepreneurs and those looking to pursue a similar career? And what legacy would you like to leave or how would you like to be remembered? Okay. Three. <laughs> well, all right. Well, the first one again is three pieces of advice. Yeah. Three key pieces sure. of advice as an entrepreneur, those looking to pursue a similar career to yours. Okay. My first one has to be <laughs> to keep going. Babylon, don't give up. Yes. So keep going. The second would be, I think there's a fine line. I think there's a balance between being coachable and taking constructive criticism and yes. not not allowing people to poo poo your dreams. So yeah. I think it's important to take criticism and not have your head in the clouds, you know, yeah. and, and to be coachable because if you think you always know what's right and you never listen to anyone else, you're probably going to just isolate yourself and you probably won't experience much success. So I would say definitely be coachable take constructive criticism and feedback. However, if it isn't constructive, don't take it. Yeah. You know, like don't let people bring you down. If there's something you really want to do, go after it. And I think having that balance is important. The third piece of advice would be to play into your strengths. So utilize your unique specific skill set, whatever that may be, bring that to the table and have that be part of what you do. Even if yes. it doesn't seem to make sense, you know, yeah. if it doesn't seem like, ah, that doesn't, you know, fit into, I want to be a business person, but I like to breathe fire. There's yes. some yes. kind of collaboration opportunity somewhere. Yes. So I would definitely say highlight your strengths, always be thinking of incorporating them in yes. some way. Okay. And then your other question was what legacy? Yeah, what legacy or how would you like to be remembered? Some people don't like the legacy part. <sighs> so I would say I'd like to be known for being a warrior, for being resilient and not giving up. Yes. And the reason for that is, again, just to let people know that anything is possible. I believe that with every fiber of my being. The word impossible does not exist in my no. vocabulary. Like. No. It just doesn't. So anything is possible. So I'd like to be known and remembered for that. And also just for being a people lover. I love people uh, and I, I want to always help them and lift them up in any way that I can. So those are the two things that are important to me. Amazing. I just wanted to touch on the last point. You've got an announcement for Clubhouse. So I don't know if you want to just let our audience know and if anyone would like to join. Yes. So I have a program coming out. It is a course along with a membership program. So it helps you to become a stronger moderator and speaker in general. So okay. if, you look, if you're looking to increase those skills, then definitely go to babylonbrook.com okay. for more information. And you can also always DM me on Instagram at babylonbrook with any questions. But the crux of the program is it's to give you an overview of Clubhouse, how to use it specific to you, but then to go deeper and how to become a moderator so you can edify yourself on there and be a clear, comfortable, and confident speaker while you're on there. So of course you can take these tools that you learn into any area of your life, but a lot of the training is how can you get on Clubhouse and just blow it out of the water for yourself and your business. That's amazing. Well, thank you so, so much. And hopefully we can have you back on the show in the future. 
And if people want to connect, you did mention Instagram, but if there's other platforms, I don't know if you're on LinkedIn or any other platforms, what is the best way for people to contact you? Sure. The best way would be to get on my mailing list and that's at babylonbrook.com. So sign up for my mailing list. I always have offers that go out. I send out every month a mindset email to help get and keep you on track. And then in addition to that, any social media across the board, I'm at Babel on Brook. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Clubhouse, <laughs> you awesome. name it. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to find me. And I also, in addition to that, I do coach for social media and speaking. So if that's something that interests you as well, you can always reach out and find out more information. Excellent. Well, thank you so, so much. And uh, like I said, it would be lovely to have you back sometime in the future to see where you are in your journey. That'd be fun. Yes. And thank you again for having me. This has been great. Thanks so much.